Um, first, very briefly, just to pick up on, on the earlier discussion uh, in the morning, uh, just to reiterate some of the differences between the Afghan and the Pakistan Taliban situation. I think this is quite important to understand. Uh, first of all, in Pakistan, uh, the, the Taliban are using religion as a political tool. Uh, they are using it uh, as they have traditionally done uh, even in, uh, uh, in the past uh, century or more, whenever they've fought uh, whichever the central power is that uh, they, are, they are fighting, that they use religion as a kind of political glue uh, to bring tribes together and to, to battle, uh, battle them. Uh, secondly, there is, of course, um, uh, socio-economic uh, grievances, and th there are uh, charges of absence of justice. And uh, particularly in Swat, uh, uh, which is not in the, the tribal belt, uh, uh, there was a big uh, gap after the princely state of Swat was uh, enveloped into the, the, the government of Pakistan. Um, in, the, in the princely state, there was actually uh, a very rudimentary form of justice, but it was very rapid justice. So every month there used to be an opportunity for ordinary citizens to gather and present their grievances uh, to the Wali of Swat, uh, the ruler of Swat, and he would immediately uh, reach a decision and pronounce judgment. So people knew that they had recourse to justice. Uh, when it was enveloped into the state of Pakistan, uh, there was no provision made for giving people the same level of, of care and control and justice. Uh, and so over time, this situ situation deteriorated, allowing uh, people who wanted to take advantage of this uh, chaos and confusion uh, to start asserting their uh, uh, power grab uh, and uh, using religion as a tool. Uh, another big difference is that unlike Afghanistan, Pakistan has a very uh, well-disciplined and organized and a very large military. Um, and it has, um, uh, unfortunately, and this is a huge difference, uh, it is fighting its own people. Uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, this is a big difference. Uh, the Taliban are using the fact that there are foreign troops uh, to galvanize support for them, uh, to, to even coerce people into helping them in the battle against uh, the U.S. and NATO forces. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, this uh, is not the case, and in fact, this becomes a serious issue for the Pakistan military itself, because uh, when you are fighting your own people, there are huge repercussions on uh, issues like collateral damage, whether it's damage of property or people. And just to give you another uh, uh, big difference between the, the battle in Afghanistan and the battle in Pakistan, Pakistan, um, for the first time since independence, when it had removed all its troops from the area that's now known as a federally administered tribal area, by agreement with the tribes, and on the orders of the, the first, the founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, um, they, they removed all the British garrisons uh, and all the, the troops that Pakistan had inherited. Uh, they emptied the cantonments of Wana and Razmuk and all the other traditional sites. Uh, and so, so for the first time under General Musharraf, uh, the Pakistan army was uh, uh, entering Fatah, and it was seen as an alien force. It was seen as a surrogate of the U.S., uh, and uh, this saw, it saw itself as an alien force too, largely because, uh, because of the composition of the army, it is still predominantly uh, based on the population uh, uh, a 60% Punjabi-dominated military with about 14.6% Pakhtuns. So uh, by the very nature of the composition of the military, it, it was seen as an alien force, and it saw itself as an alien force. Uh, no attempt was made at the time that the force was injected to try and identify those regiments that had 50% Pakhtun uh, composition uh, to send them in because they're the officers and the junior commissioned officers and, uh, would have been able to speak uh, Pashto and would have been able to converse with the locals. So th these are some of the differences. There are similarities, too, uh, going back to Mike, Michael's and, and the other comments that were made earlier. Um, when we talk of the Taliban in Pakistan, it is a very, it's a conjuries of very disparate groups. Uh, you have the TTP, 
uh, which originated in Waziristan, uh, but it is now basically a brand name that has, has provided an umbrella for bringing all the other disaffected groups. And some of them are just plain crooks who are taking advantage of the situation uh, to cover their criminal activities. Um, and you also include uh, much older uh, groups like the TNSM, uh, which uh, Imtiaz referred to and which Rodney also referred to in the settled area of Swat, which has actually been in existence since 1989. So it predates the, the arrival of the, the word Taliban in Pakistan's polity. There are also regional satraps. I mean, there are tribal groups as well as individuals within tribes who want to assert their power and control over resources, and so they have aligned themselves uh, in this kind of trans-tribal uh, 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 conglomerate. And then behind it all is Al-Qaeda, which, uh, as was said in the morning session, is using this as a very useful leverage in order to exercise its kind of franchise arrangement. And it has also attracted um, the Punjabi militant groups, the Sunni Punjabi militant groups from central and southern Punjab, uh, that had formerly been trained by the ISI as part of the Kashmir Jihad, uh, which have now aligned themselves in the fighting inside Fatah on a sectarian basis in the Kuram Agency, for instance, but have also increasingly become a uh, franchisee of Al-Qaeda and the DTP <coughs> in the rest of Pakistan and have been involved in a number of the attacks inside Pakistan proper, including against the military. So th this, these are sort of some of the, the, the factors uh, that are sort of one needs to recognize, uh, and there isn't a silver bullet uh, that will allow us to deal with this whole uh, agglomeration. Uh, now, as, the, as, as Imtiaz has pointed out, uh, when you talk of negotiations, it's really Groundhog Day. Uh, <laughs> it, it is a constant repetition of the same old, same old. And when I say same old, same old, I don't just mean in the last few years, uh, just yesterday, I was looking at a Waziristan report from 1894. And uh, I tell you, it is exactly the same story. The, uh, a tribal group would launch an attack or snipe uh, at uh, Razmak or Wana or one of these places or kidnap someone, a Hindu boy in one case, or an officer or a soldier. And then there'd be a punitive expedition, and the tribes would be beat up by you know, a large force, uh, mainly natives commanded by British. Uh, 2,000, uh, but in, in the, against the Masoods, the largest ever force was 10,400 uh, in those days, which was a lot of uh, manpower. Uh, and then uh, once they were beat up, uh, basically they would come crawling back and sue for peace, and uh, a peace deal would be signed, uh, and then they would be compensated. They'd be given mo uh, money, and not only that, but those that were more... Uh, uh, conciliatory than the rest would be made maliks and would be put on the official dole. And that practice has continued since the late 19th century till this day. Uh, it has involved a kind of corruption of the tribal system and of the jirga, so you now uh, have official jirga. And this is at the root of the governance issue in this part of the world. Um, so you basically, uh, I mean, it's very interesting that even the British report uh, uses the word Hai Toba, which is, you know, the, the, the Pakhtun tribes would come and basically beg for forgiveness, uh, and then they'd be rewarded. Uh, so th there was a kind of a built-in incentive structure which allowed the, uh, in the rebellion or the insurgencies to fester and to continue. Um, let me put a little more historical background on the rise of Talibanization. And I think here I need to pull back to a much wider canvas, as Rodney promised you that I would. Uh, first of all, Fatah uh, is a forgotten part of Pakistan. 62 years after the country became independent, uh, it has the worst socioeconomic indicators of any part of Pakistan. So can you blame anyone if they feel that they were forgotten? In fact, in the local language, uh, nobody refers to it as Fatah, which is an English acronym. Uh, it is still called Ilaka Ghair, which is the foreign land. You know, it, it's as if it doesn't exist. It's not a part of Pakistan. So politically, economically, socially, and even physically, it, has, it is still behind this so-called prickly hedge that the British talked about. 
So there is really no belonging, sense of belonging, and no sense of participation in the polity and economics of Pakistan. Secondly, over time, the state of Pakistan has become uh, a very changed state from the Pakistan which was conceived by the founder, Mr. Jinnah, as a state where Muslims could lead their own lives as Muslims and everybody else of every other faith could lead his or her life according to that faith, to a state which became first the Republic of Pakistan and then, interestingly, under uh, so-called secular leadership, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So there was a gradual uh, descent into a kind of introduction of ritualistic Islam that took over Pakistan polity and society. And this is the blowback from, uh, from that movement, in my humble view. Over time, Islam became a tool of government. It was used for cynical purposes by all the political leaders, whether they were military or civil, starting with uh, Ziaul Haq, uh, and even before him by, by uh, President and then Prime Minister Bhutto, who used Islam in order to win some tactical, uh, tactical advantages, but they didn't end up saving his government in 1977. Uh, I don't know if many of you recall, but it was he who banned uh, the Ahmadis as a Muslim group and created a sectarian divide there. It was he who made Pakistan officially a dry country. Uh, it was he who made Friday the, the day of holiday in Pakistan. Uh, in, in fact, stealing the thunder of poor Ziaul Haq, who would have wanted to have uh, made all these moves and, and carried favor with the population in general. So over time, there's been a kind of a blowback as a result of this official sponsorship of ritualistic Islam and a very convoluted uh, interpretation by many individuals and groups along the periphery of what they call Sharia. In fact, there is no consensus on what is proper Sharia. There was no consensus in the 50s when uh, the Munir Commission in Pakistan <coughs> looked at the idea of, of sectarian violence and came to the conclusion on the basis of testimony by all the leading ulama, the, the religious scholars, who were all asked one question, uh, can you define a Muslim? And none of them could come to the same definition. So uh, there's obviously uh, a desire to create some kind of homogenous view of Islam in Pakistan, uh, but it, uh, it has failed because uh, it's a very pluralistic society regardless. Uh, and so the, the whole idea of of uh, creating this homogenous uh, view of Islam was also supported by the fact that the center wanted to control everything. Although Pakistan was a federation, uh, the periphery was always disregarded, and Fatah is the extreme periphery. So Balochistan had its grievances, and that's why there were insurgencies in Balochistan. East Pakistan had its grievances, because that was the periphery. And uh, we saw what happened there. It became an independent entity. Uh, and now, of course, parts of NWFP and FATA uh, are the scene of, of an insurgency uh, because they feel that their uh, governance, their economic interests are not being uh, regarded by the center. Uh, so somehow the lack of pluralism, as well as this kind of uh, fall into the lap of ritualistic Islam, is fostering uh, the Talibanization of Pakistani society. And so there's a lack of economic opportunity. Now, what can we do? First of all, we have to differentiate between the Afghan Taliban, who, as was pointed out earlier, use Pakistan as a sanctuary. But they've been very smart. They use their tribal ties and local support in order to come and go. And they have not raised any uh, military action against the, the state of Pakistan. And as a result, the state of Pakistan has been hedging its bets on what will be the outcome in Afghanistan. And they have therefore not launched any operations against the Afghan Taliban. So you have to separate them. Uh, it's the local Taliban, the TNSM, and the Punjabi militants that the government needs to deal with. And the question here is, uh, are you going to cede space to them? Which is what happened in each of the deals that uh, Mtiaz talked about. Uh, because you, you agreed to withdraw the military to camps, and when you withdrew, uh, you created a vacuum, and they filled the vacuum. 
you didn't have the administration, you didn't have the civil uh, judicial system in place to give people uh, the kind of support that they needed for their daily lives and economic activities. And the Taliban stepped in and they started resolving disputes and executing justice rapidly. And I use the word executing as a pun because they did. They would bring in two people and say, what are your problems, and appoint a Qazi on the spot. And the Qazi would pronounce the judgment and one person would get shot and the other would win the argument. So. They provided justice very rapidly. Uh, this was the kind of brutal, uh, horrific system. And the agreement that they signed, uh, I have just one point of contention on in, with Imtiaz. Uh, I actually saw the, the, the April 2008 agreement, and it's a very simple agreement. It, it says you know, they will not burn girls' schools. So th there were very straightforward conditions that were signed by the ANP leadership and the, uh, the uh, TNSM leadership. And the very next day, they burnt the schools. But the ANP government was so scared that they didn't want to challenge them on it, and they kept the military in the camps till the situation got so much out of control that the military had to be called out again. The same thing happened in the most recent deal, uh, which after a period where the military was withdrawn uh, while the government was discussing the issue of the nizam e adal the system of justice, uh, that they would bring to SWAT, uh, that the, the Taliban swarmed the area and took over. So the military had to eventually come in because of this one video of this poor girl being beaten that created so much support for military action in the rest of Pakistan. Uh, but then uh, the military action uh, did not anticipate the IDPs. Uh, and there, there was uh, 2.5, 3 million, whatever you call it, a huge number of internally displaced people, and that issue still remains, and it's going to bedevil the situation. The, the conclusion I come to is this, that military operations are only a way of addressing the symptoms. They do not address the root causes. You have to address the socioeconomic needs of the people. And in Fatah in particular, you need to be able to create jobs, and it's, by my calculation, it's only 300,000 jobs that need to be created. This is the 17% of the male youth that are part of the youth bulge of the population of Fatah. Total population, 3.5 million. Half women, they only have a 3% literacy rate, so you cannot employ them immediately. So you have to create jobs for the young men. And if you create these 300,000 jobs, you're basically soaking up the entire catchment pool of recruits for the Taliban the tariq -e taliban of Pakistan. If you do that, uh, you can help start changing the thing. The United States has been pushing the ROZs, and we know the Pakistani government has been pushing ROZs. These will be a heavily subsidized way of creating jobs. Uh, they're not ideally located <coughs> economically, because the Chinese experience has shown us that they need to be near large urban areas. They need to be near heavy infrastructure and communication. And all that is missing in Fatah. So my suggestion would be, uh, if you want to reconcile, if you want to bring people over to your side, uh, you need to create opportunities for work for them. Uh, you need to uh, get infrastructure, construction projects, build roads connecting Fatah to the rest of Pakistan, build small dams, uh, build embankments to control the rivers, set up tube wells, uh, provide a livelihood and a possibility of a livelihood to the people and they will solve their own problems. But then at least they will feel connected, and they'll feel that something is being done for them. Uh, what should be the US role? That is a question that Rodney had posed to us. I think the US role is really ideal only in creating an enabling environment for the government of Pakistan and the people of Pakistan to do all these things, uh, to create a political situation that is mature, uh, that develops civilian supremacy over time, so that the threat of military intervention is reduced. Uh, but the US should not intrude uh, too overtly, nor be seen as siding with any single individual, or party, or a group or institution. The moment you do that, then it's Groundhog Day all over again for the US-Pakistan relationship. And that's a totally different story. Uh, and I spent a lifetime covering that <laughs> and trying to capture it in my books. I'm not going to bore with you that. Let, let me stop here. Thank you very much.